Uh, okay, I'm not going to bore you with definitions. I've got three or four pages in here. You can just read it when you get back. There's lots more definitions, believe me. They're all important, but I thought these were the most important. Uh, let's start with the broadband definition. Uh, they set forth requirements, two-way data transmission with advertised speeds, by the way, advertised, not checking, of at least 768 kilobits per second down and at least 200 kilobits per second upstream to end users. And then if you're doing a middle mile project, sufficient capacity to support provision of broadband service to end users. Well, uh, the speeds have disappointed some. I, some of you may have seen the famous quote by Vint Cerf of Google. He said, the definition of broadband sucks so badly it should be used to sequester carbon dioxide. Okay, those of you that are not in the room in San Francisco, we have people saying loudly, that's right. Okay. Um, well, obviously, uh, they, Google has reasons for saying that. But anyway, uh, I thought I would say the formal reasons why they chose that speed. Uh, it leverages the FCC's expertise. I don't know what that meant. It uses an established standard. It facilitates use of many common broadband applications like web browsing, VoIP, one-way video. A lot of the U.S. is rural, and so this modest speed is a cost-effective solution for difficult-to-serve areas. Uh, so they're being conservative for the rural areas. And finally, the speed is technology neutral because it encompasses all major wired and wireless technologies. Uh, the key word there was wireless. Uh, will this make us an OECD broadband leader? I think not, but you, know, you never know. Um, but here's the good thing. Uh, that wasn't all they did. If you look at the scoring, which we will later, you will see that they gave the applicant more points the faster the speed is through the criteria. So faster speeds will be rewarded in competitive situations. Now, just to give you a context, here at the PUC when we were doing the CASF program, our broadband program, we set a, um, not a minimum, but a benchmark speed of three megabits per second down and one megabits per second up. Um, because that's what we were thinking at this moment is kind of what you need to do, you know, Web 2.0 applications. But we did not make it a minimum because in some very rural areas, I'd be darned happy to get anything over there, right? Like decent DSL. That would make me just happier as a clam at high tide. So um, I think that they were being conservative uh, with the concern similar to what I had when we were doing our program. You know, we were just trying to get broadband out to the really rural areas. And the other thing to think about is cost effectiveness, okay? Especially when you're thinking about these really rural areas. Um, okay, next slide. Um, if you're gonna do a public computer center, take a really close look at that definition. It's pretty detailed. Make sure you meet it and make sure when you're describing your project, you're very explicit that you're meeting that definition. Next slide. Uh, broadband infrastructure, if you're doing rural, uh, they have a really, really technical definition of what is rural and what is remote. So make sure you nail those definitions and in your application you are explicit as to why you meet that definition as to your project. And you better be detailed or they may throw out parts of your um, pro uh, project. And of course the unserved and underserved definitions are important. Uh, they're different than the PUCs. They're much more, I, I actually think they're better. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Um, I thought on unserved they did a better job than we did in terms of, you know, there's some exceptions. And I thought it was very well thought out. So um, do note how underserved varies between last mile projects and middle mile projects for you middle mile guys. Okay, I'm up to slide 13, Shelley. There you go. Yeah, this one is unserved. See, this was kind of nice because in our unserved, we said, you know, there's no broadband service. Here they said there's at least 90% lacking access. So even if a couple guys on the edge of a site of an area has service, it doesn't wipe out the whole area as being unserved. So um, I thought they did a nice job there. Okay, next slide, Shelley. Okay, in step two, NTIA is going to provide to the governor's office of every state a list of eligible applications for that state that survive step one. And the states have to make a recommendation on the list to NTIA within 20 days of receipt. 
of that list. And uh, the states have been encouraged by the feds to provide mapping and planning data that support our recommendations. So uh, the governor has indicated that he does intend to provide recommendations and that the broadband ones will be done by the state CIO's office, hence Terry. And in turn, as Terry mentioned, she, is, she has asked the PUC and the Emerging Technology Fund to partner with them to help them with the review, which we're happy to do. Uh, and there will be more on that from later speakers. So um, Joe Kamisha from the CIO's office later will describe the California process for letting us see your applications after you file with the feds so that we have a jump start at looking at them. We would really appreciate that because, you know, we only got 20 days. So we would actually like to get them earlier so that we can review them with a little more time and care and be able to provide a good recommendation. Okay, for broadband infrastructure projects, just infrastructure, uh, there's, they're going to be posted at the broadbandusa.gov website for 30 days. And why did they do that? That is because if there are existing service providers who think that they actually do serve areas that are claimed to be unserved or underserved, but primarily unserved, I would think, they have a chance to tell NTIA or RUS, no, 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 I actually serve this area. And this is the 30-day window that they get to say that, okay? So if you're an existing provider, it's in your interest to be looking for these applications to go up and to provide clarity to the feds about what is really served and underserved. But you better be prepared to tell them in detail where it's served and unserved, and it will be held confidential is what it said in the NOFA. Um, but that information is critical. And you've got 30 days to submit that information if you're an existing provider. Next slide. Um, this is sort of interesting. This is general eligibility. You're supposed to finish the project two years from grant, but actually the definition of timely completion says you're two-thirds through. So I thought that was sort of interesting. Um, but hey, whatever. Uh, but I'll tell you, this is a very challenging time frame for California because we have CEQA, Environmental Review, and we have um, pretty long local permitting requirements, right? Everyone with the carriers is going to nod vigorously. So my, my, if you are an infrastructure project, you had better get on it right as soon as you file. You better be all over the locals trying to get those permits because uh, we don't have a lot of time in terms of the time frame for construction. Uh, if you have trouble, um, please let us know, the PUC and the CIO, and we'll attempt to facilitate with the ARA team through the governor's office, particularly if it's a problem with the state, a state agency. We will attempt to facilitate. We can't guarantee it, but we will sure try, because uh, we've been meeting and making some inroads with Caltrans and um, other state agencies that you might be having troubles with. We won't name them all, but you know who they are. So we will try. I can't promise, but we are going to try. So um, tough time frame. Infrastructure projects, there's four requirements for it. Got to meet the definition of broadband, must be technically feasible. You have to certify it with a professional engineer. You have to obey the non-discrimination and interconnection requirements. More on that later. And you agree to last mile coverage obligations, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Okay, so this is, um, oh, this is non-discrim interconnection rules. A lot of talk about this. We won't go deeply into this because we could spend way too much time on it. Okay, so first one, you got to comply with the FCC's Internet Policy Statement. No surprise there. I put a little website where you can see it easily. And then um, there's rumors that there might be a fifth policy being put in by the new FCC. So just keep an eye on that over at the FCC. Um, can't favor... Don't favor any lawful internet applications and content over others. Uh, you got to put your network management policies on your website. That's not a big deal. Uh, you need to connect to the public internet directly or indirectly. I don't think that's a big deal. Can't be an entirely closed private network. And then um, I think the toughest one is that last one, the interconnection one. Um, all I'll say about that is there are no internet interconnection rules. There's only telecom ones. And so that's sort of interesting. And then two, who enforces? That's all I'll say about that. 